So today I'm going to talk about the greatest era of MotoGP racing and that was the unrideable era on 500 GP bikes between 1987 and 1995. So the bikes we were riding at that time, mainly Suzuki, Yamaha, and Honda, all V4 machines, 170 brake horsepower plus, 200 miles an hour at racetracks like Hockenheim, but really unrideable. The brakes were average, carbon brakes had appeared, but they were a bit hit or miss. Uh, the tyres were basically a lot of grip, then zero grip, and the power band was, was tiny on the edge of a knife pretty much every time you rode them. So I'm going to talk about five riders today. Coincidentally, they were the guys that won the World Championship from 1987 to 1995. Amazing characters, I was lucky to race against them. I was very proud to be on the podium with every single one of them on a few occasions. So uh, just an amazing time. And I'm gonna tell you all about their strengths, their weaknesses, and a few little extra bits as well that you might find interesting. And a quick thanks to Matt Oxley for letting us use his amazing book in this video. So first guy is Wayne Gardner. <coughs> Wayne Gardner, I got to know in 1986. Out of the blue, he invited me down to Australia to ride in his little team in the Castro Six Hour Race. He was basically team manager, although he was in GPs at the time, riding for Rothmans Honda. So a very kind gesture, lovely guy, and very kind to me, getting me down to Australia to do a race. Pretty soon after that, I became his teammate in 1987, and that's when things changed. Uh, suddenly I became competition. Wayne was still friendly, but I really had to watch my backside with him then, because, uh, as I said, I was... Uh, arrival. Um, Wayne's strengths were unbelievable uh, lack of fear, didn't fear these bikes at all um, and I think probably his weakness was he didn't fear these bikes at all because they bit him in the bum quite a few times. He won the world championship in 1987, he was amazing, had some few big crashes along the way um, but didn't win any more championships after that and I think just down to that maybe just lack of being able to find a limit, um, a strength and a weakness. Alongside Wayne Gardner was, was Wayne Rainey. Wayne first came to GPs in 1988. He was, uh, he was mentored by Kenny Roberts Sr., uh, amazing talent that had come from America. He'd actually been in GPs in 1984 and 250 GPs, but went back to the States, then came back to racing 500 GPs. Wayne was a lovely guy, dead straight, dead honest, liked to party like the rest of them. I became good friends with Wayne, but very, very serious, obviously. I think his strengths, well I know his strengths were, quite often the Yamaha wasn't the best bike in the period where he was winning world championships, but Wayne would get to Sunday morning and the bike would not be sorted out, but he just never ever gave up and his, his big strength was just being able to make it happen on a Sunday. No, bad, no matter how bad that bike was, where he'd been in practice, he would find a way to pedal it around and normally get it on the podium on a Sunday. And to be honest, Wayne was pretty perfect. I guess his only downfall was that, that one career-ending crash he had in Misano in 1993. Um, but as he said at the time, he was leading the World Championship, he was leading the race. A small mistake that all of us made most weekends cost him big time. And of course, he was paralysed after that and his racing career came to an end. Um, he's been a big part of racing ever since uh, and an amazing rider, as we all know. Kevin Schwantz, I first got to know in 1986. We both showed up at Mizano on wildcard Suzuki rides. It was a square four bike back then. Uh, Kevin rode one in standard colours, I rode one in Skull Bandit colours. So we, we first appeared in, in GPs, uh, both in 1986. Kevin took part in a few races in 87, but then he came back in 88 with the Pepsi Suzuki, that, that such a famous bike at the time for a few years. Kevin Schwantz's strengths were he did not understand how uncompetitive his bike was um, to a point where he won the first race in Suzuka, blew everyone out of the paddock, no one saw Kevin winning the race. Everyone said at that time, well that was a lucky win, he won't win anymore again. A couple of races later he won again in the Nürburgring in the wet this time. Um, and everyone will tell you, uh, and probably most of the Suzuki guys as well, that the bike was not competitive. 
any of his teammates didn't really get close over the years and that, that included me um, but Kevin just believed in himself and did amazing things with that bike all the way through to when he, he won his world championship in 1993. His weak points were that he didn't understand how uncompetitive that bike was if you can believe that because I think what I'd love to have seen is Kevin with another manufacturer because he would have been unbelievable but he stayed loyal to Suzuki he kept going but I really think he had a lot more world championships in him had he been on a, a more competitive bike and maybe with a different manufacturer. Eddie Lawson I think I got to know Eddie best on Sunday nights when I was making him laugh and we were partying in motorhomes because he kept himself to himself. He very rarely saw him in the paddock during the day, get on his bike and practice, get back to the motorhome. Um, I think that was typified by the the welcome map he had outside his motorhome which based, which said in big letters, go away. So that kind of said everything about Eddie. But I did get to know him and uh, I made him laugh on quite a lot of occasions and we partied hard together on, on a Sunday night. So. Um, but his strengths were, he was just so focused. He wanted to get on his bike, as he said. He didn't want to know anything about anything else in the paddock. He just wanted to ride, win, go home, and then ride his off-road bikes when he got home. My opinion, his weaknesses were, he just, he traveled Europe. He came to Europe for all these years and and just didn't embrace or enjoy anything of it. And and Americans do have everything in America, but I, I felt like he, he lost out big time there. But as I once said to Eddie, how can there be in America the World Series of Baseball or the World Series of Basketball? And he said, Neil, why would you want to go anywhere else? So who can argue with that? So Mick Doohan, probably the guy I was closest to and had most in common with through my GP career and probably the guy I spent most time with uh, in the paddock because uh, we would we would see each other after practice, someone would be having coffee at their motorhome, it would alternate so and Mick stayed in Europe quite a lot so we spent a lot of time between races and even in the off season I'd spend time in Australia with them so I guess um, if it was come, coming down to who I was closest to, it would be Mick. And I think being Australian, um, at some point obviously of British descent, that we had a little, little bit more in common as, as far as got a, a background and kind of sense of humour and things like that goes. So, so Mick was a good guy and we still are good friends. Mick's strength was, and kind of in common with the others, totally obsessed with racing, uh, even to a point where he said he'd think about racing 100% of the time when he was there and think about racing 90% uh, throughout the rest of his the time he was racing and, and so just his, his total obsession, he even, he'll even say today, I don't even know why I thought about it that much but I just did, but I think that's why he's so successful, five world championships speak for themselves. Weak points, very difficult to find any weak points we make but um, it, his obsession might have just overlapped into some weaknesses because he, he had some fairly big injuries throughout his career. I remember going to see him in hospital one time. He was obsessed with training, he was obsessed with his weight, he was paranoid about putting weight on, which he never would. Um, but as I said, I went to see him one time and I said, mate, you're looking a bit, bit gone, a bit thin. Are you, are you eating? He says, well, I'm, I'm not eating now because I don't want to put any weight on. I said, well, what, what have you eaten today? He goes, I've had a grape one grape in one day um, he may as well not have bothered and I think stuff like that didn't really help his recovery sometimes he, he's an intelligent guy but um, sometimes that obsession can be your downfall it wasn't his downfall of course but uh, it certainly could have been <laughs> they were kind guys they were social guys they liked to party hard but if I was going to pick one that stood out a little bit from the others it might be Kevin Schwantz um, just because we all like living life on the edge, if we wouldn't go racing if we, if we didn't enjoy living life on the edge, but Kevin would take that into kind of time when we were being sociable as well, just having a normal relaxing time. Kevin liked to be on the edge. One thing he, he quite liked to do when we were out at night, we'd be sitting having a quiet drink and he'd, he'd want to, he says, you know, let me just knuckle your knuckles. 
And I go, why? He says, well, I'll do it to you and then you do it to me and then we'll, we'll keep going and then whoever quits first loses. And I couldn't quite get my head around why you'd want to inflict pain on somebody else and least of all yourself, but that's what Kevin liked to do. So uh, there was blood appeared and we rattled each other's knuckles on occasions and Kevin thought it was fun, I thought it was less fun, but I went along with it anyway. Another occasion which might have been told earlier by Rob Mack was a famous incident in a, I believe it was at Daytona in a hotel foyer. I was, I was there and uh, <laughs> Rob had, uh, Rob Mack's got one kind of sticky out nipple and Kevin knows that so Kevin would like to give him a little bit of a nipple cripple which Rob thought was funny once or twice. Three times it's getting a little bit annoying but when you get to six or seven times I know Rob's going to blow up Kevin also knows Rob's going to blow up. He's going to crack, and that's exactly what he's after. He's after that that reaction where Rob goes mad, and then, and so it happened in Daytona that time. Rob, and he's a big guy, and I wouldn't want him beating on me. But anyway, Rob just exploded, grabbed Kevin. Kevin, he got into. I can only describe it as what a, a porcupine does when it's attacked. It just makes itself into like a a ball, and Kevin made himself into a ball on the floor. Meanwhile, Rob's punching him, hitting him, kicking him. Um, and I did my very best to pull Rob off him, but Rob had to get rid of this energy, beat Kevin up. All the time he's beating him up, Kevin's just laughing and giggling because Kevin, it was job done for Kevin. He'd achieved exactly what he wanted. And, and we were all friends afterwards, but it's just so awkward at the time and just seeing Kevin being Kevin, but all great fun. I wouldn't change it for the world. Okay, so that's the end of my chat on the superheroes. Uh, see you next week. <clears throat> How much that? How much that? Didn't it? <laughs> Don't put your glasses on when you're upside down, moustache.